And that's what this is saying. This is not the one where the boat's about to sink and all of those things and they're afraid for their life. This is the one where they're just burning themselves down out there toiling against the wind trying to obey what they considered was the whim of Jesus. But have you, have you ever prayed for things because you have a need and it just didn't seem like the answer was coming through? Has anyone ever really needed something before? And you, or you desire something and you've been praying for it and the answer just has not come through yet. What do we do in those times? Uh, so I want to talk to you about how to press in and get that answer in Jesus' name. Can we do that for a moment? Amen. Philippians 3.14 is an interesting scripture. Uh, let me just tell it to you like this. The Apostle Paul, the writer of 13 books of the New Testament, said, For I press toward the mark, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Here's a man that was extremely qualified by God to do what he did, but he never thought he arrived. And he, he talked about something that I think is very powerful. He, he began to make us understand that there is a response from heaven if we desire earnestly the things of God and if we press toward those things. That word press is an interesting word and it just, for the sake of time, it just means to stretch and to press and to reach toward that mark. It means to go as far as you can possibly go and just press. Come on, put a hand out like this and just press. And just lean forward a little bit and say, press. Come on, say it, press. Now lean a little bit further and say, press. Now reach a little bit further. Don't fall out of the chair, but reach a little bit further. Come on, just a little bit and just a little bit. That's exactly what that word means. It means to stretch and stretch and press and to just go the best you can and continue to press with all your might. Just press. Paul said, I press toward that mark, that scopus of God, the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. He said, I have focused in on it. It's the, the scopus, it's the Greek word. It just means to scope in like that. He said, I'm scoped in on this thing and I am zeroed in on it and I am pressing toward the mark. Let me just say this because of my, short, my time will be short tonight because of the ministry time we had earlier on during praise and worship. But now listen to this real quickly. Never stop pressing for an answer. That's not a lack of faith. Uh, Jesus more than one time said to people who were pressing through the crowd and who wouldn't shut up and who were just doing regardless of what anyone else said and regardless of how long they were doing it, they're still doing it. And Jesus said to them, man, that's great faith. Now, you can do anything, I guess, in unbelief, but if uh, in those instances, those were people that were expecting as they kept pressing and pressing and pressing, they had to be disappointed every day. The blind man had to be disappointed every day, day after day after day, but it didn't stop him from doing what was right. He kept pressing. He kept pressing. He kept pressing. And there comes a time in the name of Jesus where your answer comes. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so sometimes it seems like that answer is not going to come. You notice in Mark chapter 6, this is the story of Jesus having just multiplied five loaves and two fishes. He's multiplied the bread and fish. They have fed 5,000. There's 12 baskets left over. And then Jesus says to them in Mark chapter 6, look at this if you would. In Mark 6, in verse 47... And when the evening was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone in the land. Let, let, me, let me back up just a little bit, because I want you to get this in verse 46. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. Uh, the Bible says, And when evening was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and Jesus was alone on the land. Jesus was alone. Look at verse 45. Straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples, this is very important, which means strongly encouraged. The word constrained, it's an interesting word. 
It's almost like he gave them an option. But he was encouraging them to take door number one. Does everybody understand that? It says, and he constrained them. He was strongly encouraging the, his disciples right here. Uh, that's probably because they've just fed 5,000. They've got to be tired. Uh, it's been a long day. It would have to have been a long day. They're, they're just totally blown away by the miracle of provision that has taken place. And then Jesus immediately says, look, I really want you to get in this boat and, and go to the other side under Bethsaida. Uh, go before me over there implying I will be there later. You go now. Have you ever had God tell you to do something and you're just like wore out? Like come to church on Wednesday night. Can I have a hallelujah? hallelujah. But you come anyway. Amen. You make that decision because you love God. And I don't care who you are. Every person has a need of some kind. There's always a need or a desire uh, can I just say this to you? If you don't have anything that you need or desire, would you please expand your life? Would you just pray that God can bless you so you'll be a blessing to someone else? Just bless you with more than what you have and give you wisdom on how to use it? Uh, everyone should have a need and a desire some way. And so Jesus is telling them, I've just blessed you. I've, you've seen miracles. Uh, you've seen the multiplication. You're just taking care of 5,000. And there's 12 baskets left over, and I'm sure you don't think you have any kind of a need, but I need you to go to the other side in front of me because I want to do a crusade over there. That's what he wanted to do. So they were part of his uh, four team, you know, his forward team, his advance team, and he was going to go do a crusade over in uh, Gennesaret at that particular time, and he wasn't going to waste time. He wanted them over there. He goes up in a mountain and prays. Then he comes back and he gets on the shore. And the Bible says the disciples got into a boat. They said, that's what he wants us to do. I know we're tired, but, you know, it looks like a good night. So let's get out here and let's go to the other side. So the Bible says they get into the boat. And when evening was come, verse 47, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and Jesus was alone on the land. And he saw them. Now, this is important. Now, either he used his Holy Ghost eyes and was able to see way off, or they really haven't gone too far yet. Because he went up into a mountain and prayed for a while, and then he came back down on the land, and he's watching them out there. And he's seeing them toiling, because the Bible says a wind had come up, and they're going right into the face of that wind. The Bible doesn't say here that the sea is all real bad, and they're about to, the boat's going to sink, and all of that. It just says these guys are out there pulling against that wind. Have you ever tried to row a boat against the wind? Yes, I'll be honest with you, it doesn't really take a strong wind uh, to, to wear you out real quick. And that's what this is saying. This is not the one where the boat's about to sink and all of those things and they're afraid for their life. This is the one where they're just burning themselves down out there toiling against the wind trying to obey what they considered was the whim of Jesus. After the big miracle, like doesn't he ever sleep? Doesn't he ever stop? Doesn't he ever take his foot off the gas? Lord, I'm out there just giving it all I have, and I'm trying to obey you, and now the wind comes up, and it's not a tailwind, it's a headwind. And so they're extremely tired, and it's about the, the fourth watch of the night, so by this time it's around midnight. These boys are tired. Everybody shout tired. And when evening was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea. They'd got about halfway over there, and he's alone on the land. And then he sees them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary or was in their face, was contrary to them. It was not a, a, a commodious wind. And the Bible says, and about the fourth watch of the night, about midnight, Jesus comes unto them walking upon the sea, and he would have passed by them. Say that out loud with me. He would have passed. I, have you ever been praying? Come on. Doing everything you know to do, you think, and as you're praying, it's like everybody else is getting an answer, but God must be passing me by. Why, why is my miracle not happening? I have some good news for you. You ready for this? Keep rowing. Just keep rowing. 
Just keep praising God. Keep worshiping God. Keep putting your hand to whatever it is God has called you to do. Uh, continue to be in the house of God. Continue to pray. Continue to read the Bible. Uh, continue to give. Uh, continue to be full of good works. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Continue to work on yourself. Continue to work on your words. Continue to work on your thoughts and get them in line with the goodness of God and the Word of God. Just continue. Just because the wind's in your face doesn't mean you have to start cussing. Hallelujah. Is, it, is this too deep for a Wednesday night? We got you out in the deep sea. You're right in the middle of it now. Glory to God. Because Jesus sees you. And I believe his heart was so moved. I think there's two things involved here. He sees them out trying to obey him. And it's obvious that Jesus knew that a wind was going to come up. He sees them out trying to obey him. And maybe because there had just been this big miracle and the, the, the 12 baskets was left over just out of a few little fishes, maybe these guys had lost sight of the big picture that if it wasn't for him... Or maybe they're thinking because of him, nothing's ever going to go wrong. My goodness, he's raising the dead. He's healing the blind. He's multiplying things. He's teaching in such a way that the uh, Pharisees and the scribes, uh, they're just ashamed to get around him. This is awesome. We're all of that in a bag of chips. Come on, in golf shoes. It's all there. We're on the winning side. And Jesus said, go to the other side. I know we're tired. Come on, boys. There must going to be a tailwind. Help us. Who knows? We may start going 30 knots across this thing. And they get out there, and the wind gets in their face. And they are so tired, they don't know what to do. So what did they do? They just kept rowing. They could have turned around, pointed that thing back toward the, the, the shore. One of them could have said, hey, Jesus, back over there. He might have missed it on this one. Let's just let that wind blow us there. But they didn't do that because the scripture says, let's go to the other side. He said, I need you to go over there. And he actually said, I'll meet you over there. They're probably thinking, I wonder how he's going to do that. And so they're out rowing and rowing and rowing. And maybe for the first time, Jesus has told them to do something. And instead of the miracle happening, it just looks like a mess has taken place. And I have no idea what's going through their mind at this time. But I know human nature enough to know they're probably questioning a whole lot of things at this point. Because everything has been so easy up till now. Jesus says it, bam, it just happens. They press through the crowds and touch him. Bam, and miracles take place. Uh, we need to feed a few thousand. Bam, Jesus just breaks it, multiplies it off, and good things are happening. You need to go to the other side. Come on, boys. And all of a sudden, they're stopped almost in the middle of the sea, toiling against a headwind. Woo, glory to God. Whatever you do, somebody shout press. press. Whatever you do, keep pressing. Amen. Keep praying. Keep worshiping the Lord. Come on, keep dancing before the Lord. Keep lifting your voice to God. Keep going to the hospital and visiting that one that's in the hospital and praying over them. Keep baking a cake and bringing a little glass of water. Keep doing whatever you're doing in the name of the Lord. Don't just say, well, I'm just going to back off and quit. I'm just so tired. I'm just so tired I'm going to quit. I know the Lord called me to do this, but it's just too much. No, 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 because something is going to happen. The Scripture says Jesus sees them, and I don't know if he's going in a straight line toward uh, Gennesaret. I'm not really sure exactly what the route is. I don't know if they've been blown off course at this point. All I know is they're toiling, and that word means exactly what it says. It means they are burning it down right now. And Jesus suddenly goes walking beside them. He decides, I think I'll just walk on top of your biggest problem. Hallelujah. Whatever's stopping you from doing the will of God and the ways of God, God's just walking right on top of it. He hadn't changed anything. He's just walking on top of it. I believe his heart, I believe the heart of Jesus at that point was, man, these boys do love me. They love what's going on right now because they're not backing off. I don't care what happens. They could have been offended. They could have been upset. They could have said, if Jesus wanted us to get over there, how come he didn't lend his two arms to help row in here? They could have done a whole lot of stuff. Uh, how many of you are glad they didn't do that? Yeah. 
Can I get a better amen? amen. He just gets in there and, and the Bible says he sees them and I think his heart was so moved by their effort of, to obey him and to do the last thing that they knew was the will of God. They're still pressing toward it and they're not stopping. Once again, the, the easy thing to do would have been to turn back. Just turn the nose of that thing the other direction. And then you'd have just been blowing the other way. The problem is Jesus would have been coming this way and you'd have been going that way. They just continue to go. And the Bible says, And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he, uh, he comes unto them walking upon the sea. Now watch this. And he would have passed by them. How many of you are glad that there's a visitation from the Holy Ghost moving toward you? Amen. I mean, while you're doing the will of God, God's coming. The Bible says goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. Come on. What's that prayer you've been praying over? Goodness and mercy is coming towards you. It is following you right now. Glory. I think you ought to just lift your hands up to the Lord. Come on, church. And just begin to thank God right now that you're in the house of God. You've been praying. You've been studying. You've been witnessing this week. You've been giving. You've been sharing. You've been doing everything you know to do. And I, I hear the Holy Ghost say that Jesus, goodness and mercy, the Spirit of God is walking beside you and you're about to see a miracle breakthrough in your situation. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. When they're toiling, what they're doing is actually being set up right now. They're being set up for a major breakthrough in their life and in the ministry at this particular time. Jesus is about to heal an entire section of the country. He's about to get all the cities, all the towns, all the sick people, and they're going to do it in such powerful ways. The people are going to come out and just lay them on the sides of the street. They're going to go and press through the crowds just so they can touch the hem of Jesus' garment. Amen. Something big is trying to break through when you feel like you've been toiling. I don't mind telling you as a pastor, uh, in, in my 33 and a half years of pastoring this church and almost 40 years now of pastoring, including the time I assisted my father before I went into the ministry full time, this is about my 40th year now to be in ministry. Amen. I'm getting pretty excited thinking about that. Amen. And I believe that the past 12 months have been more toiling than any time in my life. Toiling. You say, why is that? Because I've seen something in my spirit that's bigger than anything I have ever seen before up till now. And sometimes when God uses you to pioneer something or to break through in an area, when God uses you like that, you, you literally are like a, an icebreaker. You're like one of those ships that God uses. You don't know this when he calls you because if you knew it, you wouldn't have done it. I didn't know there were no charismatic Holy Ghost churches in this area that had, that had ever been built. There were denominational churches and there were people that loved Jesus, but there were no churches like this in Galveston County that had ever been built at that time. And the Lord called us here. And so I'm talking about with buildings and, and setting up something. There might have been, you know, a, a storefront here or a storefront there. I'm not really sure. But I learned years ago that when you, when you build a building, you claim that piece of property and you say, right here is different. This is where the move of God takes place. Everything heightens right there. The glory begins to increase. Come on, somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Miracles begin to happen. The whole thing begins to take place. I didn't know when God called me in the ministry that I would be studying sometimes seven days a week, praying more than that. I didn't know that we'd be building buildings like that. All I knew is we're going to toil against the wind, and I don't have any problem just sticking my nose right against that wind in the name of Jesus as long as I know he told me to do it because, listen, I know before it's over, he comes walking on the water right beside me. Woo, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Can God trust you against the wind? I said, can God trust you against the wind? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We don't change our doctrines. We don't change what we know and believe in the Word of God just because times, or because the wind's not always at our back. No, exactly the opposite. Sometimes you just, you just make that decision. And you just, you just put the nose of that, 
uh, like if you're flying a plane, you know exactly what I'm saying, brother. You put the nose, he's been a pilot for about 45, 50 years. You put that nose right into that, uh, into that wind, and sometimes that thing will almost have you at a standstill. And you just, you're just giving it all the gas you can, and it's just at a standstill. And then all of a sudden you have no idea, you don't control the wind or anything. All of a sudden, sometimes the, the, the tower will say, okay, uh, we'll let you go up another thousand or two thousand feet. And you get up there, and instead of it being on the tip of the nose, for some reason there's a current of wind that all of a sudden is in the back. And the next thing you know, you've made up all of that lost time. Hallelujah. If you've got a hundred a mile an hour tailwind, and you're trying to go 400 knots this way, and you're almost, and you got one right in your face at about 100 miles an hour, the most you could do would be 300. And you're just eating up gas. But when that one gets behind you, if you've got it powered to 400 and you get a 100 knot tailwind, all of a sudden you're going over 500. And it happens, bam, that's just that quick sometimes. Is anybody, I know that's boring, isn't it? Y'all don't even want to hear it. What you don't do is turn around and go back. As long as you've got the fuel. How many of you glad the Holy Ghost is with the fuel you need? Come on, guys. And so you just keep going. You keep going. And when he saw, the Bible says, verse 49, uh, when the, and when they saw him walking upon the sea, walking upon their problem, they supposed it had been a ghost, and they cried out. Can I just say to you, if you're, if you're doing your best to obey God, you may misjudge circumstances sometimes. Just keep obeying God. Amen. Just keep obeying the Lord. Jesus came to them not because of their revelation. He came to them because of their obedience. How many of you are glad the willing and the obedient? You know, we get that obedient part down. It's that willing part sometimes that... that trips us up. Does anybody know what I'm saying? When I was a kid growing up, my mom and dad would correct me, and I, you know, I had a little attitude because I just had attitude, and probably as much or more than any of my other brothers and sisters. And if I didn't like something, I just could not hide it off of my face. And the worst thing I could ever do was not like something in the face of my mother or father. Because if they said one thing and I didn't like it, oh my goodness, in the Hallam house where I grew up, there's an old saying that goes, it was just too wet to plow. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> My daddy's words, Katie, bar the door. Y'all heard that one, of course? And that's just the way it was because in their opinion, it wasn't, the job wasn't done until my attitude was tamed a little bit. And uh, so I couldn't do something with an attitude because it wasn't done until the attitude was adjusted a little bit. And he understood the art of adjusting the attitude from the backside. That's a deep mystery. In the last days, I'm sure that'll happen again. And so anyway, my attitude would get adjusted a little bit. And uh, sometimes you get in the middle of a situation and you misjudge that situation. And they think they see a demon. They think they see a spirit. And the Bible says they're toiling and they're toiling. But Jesus saw that they were continuing to try to obey, even if they were misjudging something at the moment. How many of you are glad for the mercy of God? Amen. For they all saw him and were troubled. They were afraid. Here, here's what the Spirit of God said to me about this. Listen, when you have fear or you have any type of question about the will of God in something, God, listen to me, is going to speak to you. God is going to talk to you because your assumption can get you in trouble uh, if it's wrong because you'll take an assumption and almost produce it like a fact. And then you'll have a response that's based upon an assumption that might not be accurate. But when the voice of God speaks to you, so the scripture says, here they are, they're, steer, they're still toiling, they misjudged it, they're troubled, and immediately he talked with them and said unto them, be of good cheer, it is me, be not afraid, woo, hallelujah, glory to God. A lot of times we're crying out for an answer from God, and we don't even recognize it's God who's with us. But Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. 
and a stranger they will not follow. You might have been praying over something. You might have been in obedience just, and you're not seeing the answer or the breakthrough yet. And I, this is just a little part of what I was going to speak on tonight, but my time's up. But listen, here's what you do. Say this with me, church. Keep rowing. Come on, say it again. Keep rowing. Say it like this. Keep praying. Keep, praying. Keep believing. Keep, believing. Keep confessing the Word. Keep, the Keep giving. Keep, giving. Keep, sharing. Keep sharing. Walk in love. Keep, love. Keep praising. Keep, Keep worshiping. Worship. Keep, Keep rowing. rowing. Keep putting your hand to the plow. Come on, stand on your feet right now and just lift your hands to the Lord. And let's just make that declaration. The Bible says, Jesus spoke to them. And as he spoke to them, the Bible says, then he went to them and got in their ship. He got in the boat with them. God will meet you at the place of obedience. He always has and he always will. That storm or that wind didn't catch Jesus off guard. I believe it must have been the enemy trying to stop that boatload of anointing that was coming across there. And they didn't know the breakthrough that's going to happen, the revival that's about to break through on the, uh, at Gennesaret. As soon as they got to the shore, the people recognized it's the healer. It's Jesus. They listened to him for a moment and just started bringing all of the sick. And he started going from town to town, and they would just bring them to him. The devil thought, I could stop this with a little wind, but he misjudged their faithfulness. And they were faithful to keep rowing. Somebody shout press. press. They just kept pressing. Hell misjudged. And Jesus said, man, I, I got to walk right out in the middle of that. I'm going to get right in the middle of that. And that he got up in the boat with them, in the place of their problem, in the place of their uh, tiredness, and the wind ceased. And they were stunned and amazed beyond measure. And they constantly were asking, how did this happen? Glory to God. Jesus will meet you at the place of obedience. Listen, it's not always convenient to tithe and offer at the place of obedience. It's not always convenient to go to the hospital and visit that loved one and pray for them at the place of obedience. It's not always uh, convenient to wake up at four in the morning and get on your knees and pray or get your Bible and read and let the Holy Ghost speak to you. It's not always convenient, but God will meet you at that place of faithfulness and that place of obedience. To learn more, visit WalterHallam.net. Here you'll find a list of resources to help you in your daily walk with Christ. With his stripes, I was healed. God knows how to kill your giant with just a little rock. When I see it and say it, I've got good news. That revelation Jesus of Christ, Jesus Christ satisfies your soul when nothing else will. No, you believe that Jesus is the Savior. When people hear the word of God, faith comes. Oh, glory to God. You still got to believe the word and say it with your mouth.